in just a moment. This is Courtney Kingery from the Indiana Soybean Alliance. So thank you for joining us. We're about a minute out, so folks are starting to come into the room. So again, thank you for joining us. We'll begin in about a minute. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is Courtney Kingery from the Indiana Soybean Alliance. Looks like we've got some folks still filtering in to the meeting room. So thank you for joining us. We'll begin in just a moment. A few housekeeping things. Please remember to put your microphone on mute if you're not speaking. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. All right, well, we've got a good group of folks um, joining us today. So thank you for joining us. My name is Courtney Kingery. I'm the CEO of the Indiana Soybean Alliance. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. We will be having a Q&A after the presentation. So you can ask questions by raising your hand in the participant feature. Um, also, you can unmute your microphone. You can also put questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom and we will be watching those and keeping an eye on those as well. Um, so either of those that you, you do have the choice to do that. Looks like we have a couple of folks coming in. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Courtney Kingery, as I said, CEO of the Indiana Soybean Alliance, and we are a statewide organization serving the 20,000 Indiana soybean farmers through checkoff, membership, and policy programs. The checkoff side of our organization supports research, promotion, and education programs that increases demand, expands markets, and find new uses for soybeans. Rachel, looks like we're still on the queue. There we go. And that new uses is why we're here today. In 2003, the Indiana Soybean Alliance and Purdue University created the Indiana Soybean Alliance Chair in soybean utilization research. The goal of supporting a member of the faculty in their search to find new and better ways to use soybeans. In the past few decades, researchers have found a number of new and innovative uses for soybeans and soy derivatives, including soy ink, crayons, soy wax, and more recently, pore shield, which is a soy-based concrete durability enhancer. The research supported by Indiana soybean farmers is about investing in future demand. We look forward to future innovations developed and brought to the market, increasing the value of Indiana soybeans, future innovations that will be new revenue streams for Indiana's farmers. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Dean Karen Plout of the Purdue University School of Agriculture. Dean Plout will speak more about the endowed position and introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Nate Mosier. Dean Plout, glad to see you today, even though this is virtual and you're a little uh, stamp, postage stamp size, but it's good to see you. Thank you for your continued support and all the work that you and the team are doing to benefit Indiana soybeans. Dean Plout, welcome. Thank you, Courtney. 
Really, really appreciate it. And the first thing I really want to do is thank the Indiana Soybean Alliance and Courtney for all the support that they have given uh, Purdue over the years. This has been just a great relationship, a relationship of mutual respect, a relationship of working together, and really uh, building partnerships that Indiana is known for, making it so that we all win. We all do better as a result of that. We are here as a land grant institution to support our farmers, to help make in, to increase Indiana's prosperity, to help teach our students, uh, to teach our students to be innovative and some of the future leaders uh, in the state and continue to make the business of agriculture prosper. And we have a great example of that in Dr. Nate Mosier. He is a professor of ag and biological engineering and he became the Indiana Soybean Alliance Chair in Soybean Utilization Research in 2015. That's a long title. I'm excited to celebrate his success over the last five years as the Alliance Chair. Um, what we do as an institution, when we have endowed chairs like this, we routinely ask them to give a seminar as part of the five-year process. So we're delighted to do that with Nate. One of the reasons we do that is not only so that they can talk about their past accomplishments, but also to inspire people about their vision for the future, because these are visionaries and Nate is right up there in terms of his vision for the future uh, for this endowment. It's gonna be exciting. Uh, they're probably members of both Purdue as well as Indiana Soybean Alliance together on this um, Zoom call or Zoom webinar, which, which is unusual. I mean, usually we each stay in our silos and give a talk here and then give a talk uh, there. But the excitement of this technology is it allows us to do that together and really uh, bring together people that have a passion and an interest in this area. Uh, just a couple things to keep in mind, and Nate will give you more detail. Uh, he's mentored students from more than 20 different majors and seven different colleges through the competition. That's pretty exciting uh, and tells you the reach is well beyond the College of Agriculture, and that's what we like to see. We know it's going to take leaders in all different uh, sectors to move us forward. Uh, he enhanced the competition by developing the Inspire program, which he'll talk a little bit about, I'm sure. He's also worked on, on the area of building new products, research for soy products, um, particularly replacing the polyols and uh, some things like that with different enzymes and, uh, and has engaged in product testing. So really excited what he has done to continue um, moving forward in innovation for the Indiana Soybean Alliance. Um, many of you may know that he not only serves in this role, but as of January, he took over as the department head of Ag and Biological Engineering, a, a big role in and of itself. But despite his new responsibilities, he maintains a commitment to the new uses chair, which is usually how we refer to that chair. And we're excited to celebrate really what he's done over the previous five years and hear about his plans for the future. And I'm sure it's gonna be a lot of fun. I look forward to um, the question and answer at the end. And please feel free to ask whatever questions you have, because I know Nate, and Nate loves answering things that people ask him. Uh, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Nate so he can talk about soil, soybean utilization, innovation, discovery. And thank you so much, Nate, for agreeing to this format where we have two organizations working together for the same goal. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, let me get my uh, screen share working here. Wonderful, great. So uh, again, I'm Nate Mosier. Uh, thank you so much for the, uh, the introduction. Um, I've been at Purdue uh, now uh, nearly 20 years. Um, just a little bit of background on myself. I've, I've uh, worked my, in, my entire time uh, in uh, innovation in the areas of renewable resources, uh, fuels, polymers, chemicals, uh, better utilizing agricultural materials for uh, new uses and expanding the, the reach and impact of agriculture beyond just food, uh, feed, and fiber. Uh, but touching our daily lives in, in numerous uh, other ways. So 
I'd like to sort of maybe start from the, uh, the beginning here. So back in 2014, when I was being considered for this chaired position, uh, I was asked to put together a vision. Uh, what, what would I do in this, in this position? And I sort of outlined uh, sort of two broad areas of, of potential impact. Uh, one in, in the area of research, uh, particularly in developing new tools, new technology that will enable new uses for soybeans. Um, I see my role primarily in, in this area is, is really building that toolkit that allow those innovators, those entrepreneurs, those companies to move forward with developing new products and, and using uh, the great uh, properties of, of soybeans you know, in a wide array of, of uh, new consumer products. But in addition, and Dean Plout uh, mentioned this in her introduction, I see this as a real opportunity for outreach. Uh, the ability to connect with producers, uh, connect with researchers across our entire campus and the breadth and depth of the expertise here at Purdue University. The processors, those that uh, take grain such as soybean in and, and process it into these various products and industrial users and, and in no small way actually students as well. So to sort of uh, <clears throat> expand that a little bit, I sort of see my role here in, in, in two prongs and I'm going to sort of tell a story or spin a tale here over the next few minutes about some of the things that I've been involved with over the last five years. Uh, it, we'd be here all afternoon if I were to, to talk about everything that I've, I've been involved with, but maybe a, a couple of vignettes in a couple of different areas to help uh, share what I've been doing, some things I've learned and maybe a revised vision or expanded vision going forward. So in the area of research, I, I focus my effort and I'll tell two stories or one for each of these two areas. Um, can we expand existing applications of technology that's been developed at Purdue or in partnership with ISA? And we already heard about uh, one of those already. Uh, this uh, concrete sealant technology was developed as a partnership between ISA and Purdue and is still moving forward. And are there some other applications of the technology that enables that in other spaces? Can we develop new approaches, new tools, new technology that expand the ability for us as a society to use soybean and new and novel approaches? And then in the outreach, um, I'll tell a couple stories and I'll focus around the student soybean innovation competition. Um, for more than a quarter century, the Indiana Soybean Alliance has supported uh, every year this competition. And it's, I think, a testament to the vision of ISA and the commitment of the uh, board members to sponsor this and continue supporting this over these years. And while there's been some dis discussion of some of the impacts in terms of products, we've heard soy crayons and soy wax, uh, but I think in terms of the, the people that have come through this, the students that have participated and um, what it has done for them and what they've learned about agriculture and about soybeans, I think also has enormous impacts. And we'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and, and some, maybe some opportunities uh, 25 years, now 26 years is a long time, and I think uh, we can start getting some dividends from those investments uh, uh, in the past that can have some far-reaching impacts. So let's talk about research and some potential areas of impact, and I, I think it's a good idea, and, and certainly my background as an engineer, uh, we want to think about what's the current landscape and where might the opportunities be so we can invest our time and our resources where we can potentially have the greatest impacts. So here we see um, chemical market use of soybean, primarily soybean oil derived products globally. And this comes from a very market research, a market research company where they're trying to project ahead into 2024. You'll notice the pie doesn't change much, but of course it's hard to predict where new technologies may come in. Uh, but a couple things I wanna highlight here, you can see a very big, almost half the circle is, is blue and we're, where it simply says soy oil. So soybean oil directly can be used in a lot of industrial applications and already is being used in industrial applications. Now I know from my conversations with uh, many producers, uh, biodiesel uh, looms large. Uh, it's certainly opened up new markets. And in terms of a slice of the pie, that little uh, yellow slice, it, it's not insignificant, but it's not nearly as big as some of the others. Soy wax, many of you are familiar with soy wax and certainly the Indiana Soybean Alliance has invested in developing applications of soy wax. 
Um, and it's important, but it's a, a fairly small uh, slice. And then there's a couple others that may be less familiar to uh, the audience members, isoflavones and polyols. Um, and let me kind of unpack those a little bit as to what they mean and, and how they're useful. Let me start with isoflavones, uh, maybe a bit of a mouthful and maybe unfamiliar to, to many folks. So isoflavones are a, a kind of nutraceutical, so it's maybe a new word to, to some. Uh, a, it's not a pharmaceutical, but it's a natural product that does have uh, health benefits in the human body. So isoflavones are natural compounds that are found in, in soybeans that act in the body sort of like estrogen. So there's a fairly substantial, and from that pie, you can see a fairly large market uh, for uh, supplements, for uh, health uh, impacts from this particular product. But um, isoflavones are a fairly small percentage of the overall soybean. They're very high value, and it's certainly a great added benefit for the processors of soybeans to have this market available to them. But it doesn't do a whole lot to move the pile, right? So just a, a tiny, tiny fraction of a bushel of beans goes into making isoflavones, and so there's maybe not as much opportunity as, there, as we would like um, to, to look at that moving forward. Soy oil and soy oil uh, methyl esters, which is just the chemistry term for biodiesel, but it had, those methyl esters have a lot of other applications as well, certainly is a big part of moving the pile, right? So if we look at the graph uh, on the upper left of US biodiesel uh, applications, the, the millions of pounds of soy oil being consumed for this is, is, is substantial. And there are other new uses for oil as well. Uh, many of you, I think, are familiar with the, the product, uh, the, the, the tire development at Goodyear, uh, supported by USB funding to uh, utilize soybean oil as part of their uh, process. Um, and I think one thing to take away from that uh, example in Goodyear, it's not just enough as the, for it to be a replacement. Maybe we think of biodiesel as, as a replacement for diesel fuel. But in the case of the Goodyear uh, product, the soybean oil not only replaces a petroleum product, but it enhances the performance of the tire. It works better because of soy. It's not just more sustainable. It's not just better for uh, the U.S. farmer, but it makes a product the consumer will want because it actually gives them value as well. It works better. Polyols. So this may be the, the term that's unfamiliar to you all, but I think if you're at all interested in soybeans, you're familiar with the, the soybean-based foams. Uh, we see the photograph of that spray insulation used in housing and building and construction, and the, the foams used in, in, in upholstered uh, uh, furniture or car seats. Uh, those are two applications of what are known as polyols. Uh, these are derived from soybean oil and have a wide variety of applications, not only for foams, but there are a number of other potential industrial applications as well. And I'm gonna focus here a little bit because I have um, did a little bit of, of uh, work in trying to expand that area. So let's talk about the, those two products, the biodiesel or the methyl esters and the polyols. And the first uh, short story I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about is expanding uh, the use of an existing technology. So we know that um, soybean oil methyl esters or methyl soyate, as it says on here, uh, can be uh, formulated in order to make a, a great concrete, uh, concrete sealer. But there may be other applications as well. And certainly some early market applications uh, made the obvious jump from concrete to masonry more broadly and generally. Uh, here we see someone applying a, a sealant to a brick wall. But there are other places where sealants are important as well in, in home and construction applications and, and grout sealants in bathrooms and kitchens. And actually, the, one of the bigger markets is in wood, in wood products, and uh, places like a deck that we see here. And so we uh, decided, and, and with the support of ISA, to examine some options and some possibilities of expanding the use of this technology from concrete masonry to wood products and see how this might work. And so uh, what we, we started with was an initial evaluation. Uh, would the product work as formulated uh, for wood products? And so this is an earlier uh, iteration of the concrete sealer known as soy isolator. And we decided to compare sort of two um, good examples of products in the market that actually have different technologies involved in how they work. Thompson's water seal, um, 
They have a great marketing uh, campaign. I think almost everybody on the call at least will be familiar with the term Thompson's water seal. And then varathane or polyurethane uh, seals that are used in wood products broadly. Uh, this is just uh, an example of, of one of a mul multitude that are on the market. They both use different uh, technologies. Uh, polyurethane uh, uses a, a chemical technology to make a kind of a polymer coating on the wood product. And Thompson's water seal, which many people don't realize, it's, it's little more than paraffin wax uh, dissolved in a solvent. So you're just basically waxing the wood. Um, if you talk to someone who works in construction, they say, don't use that. It doesn't last very long. You have to keep buying product over and over again. I guess that's a good marketing strategy if, you, if you're the one making Thompson's water seal. Uh, but it is a different approach to, to sealing product. So we uh, went uh, and, and compared these products side by side using industry standard uh, techniques and technologies. Um, we do some very high tech uh, research and, and we, when I talk here in a few minutes about uh, some of the work on the other things that we, we do, it's definitely much higher tech, but uh, this is a pretty straightforward idea. You paint wood or brush wood with a, a sealant, you let it dry. We see some uh, pieces of wood hanging here. And then we do some tests and tests that are important in the industry and important to the consumer. Uh, so these are standard tests, uh, international standard tests that are used in industry. Um, you can do these at home, right? This is just a miter saw and some two by fours and cut them up and, and you treat them. Uh, what we see here, uh, one of my students doing is a, a, a dry test. There are two versions of this. It looks like he's blowing out birthday candles, and that's pretty much what he's doing. The test is a little more than you put some uh, cotton ball lint and see if you can blow it off or not, if it sticks or it doesn't. Uh, the other one is a, a touch test. If you put your finger on the wood and then you put it on a piece of glass, you leave a fingerprint. Is it dry to the touch? That's, that's really all the test is. Some of these are pretty simple. But they do uh, uh, give us give some insights in sort of the important aspects the consumer and, and the market is looking for. The number one, if you're putting on a wood sealant, you want it to keep the water out. So that's number one, water repellency. And then show photos of this, but it's a fairly straightforward process as well. You take a, a piece of that two by four, you soak it in water, and then you treat a piece of the two by four and you soak it in water and you measure the difference in how much water gets absorbed into that wood product. And so we see our side by side comparison of our sort of three uh, comparisons, our Varathane wood sealant, our Thompson's water seal, and our soy based wood sealant, which is just the concrete sealant, just out of the can, used as is, no modifications. And we see it actually does a pretty good job, not quite as good. So this is a, it, it reduces the amount of water absorbed by 70% is how you, how you would read these. Not quite as good as the other two, but pretty close, especially since we didn't do anything to try to actually make a made for purpose uh, wood sealant. Water repellency is important, but the other important aspect of this, whether you work in construction or you're just uh, trying to seal your own deck at home is how long after you treat the wood, can you use the product? How long does it take to dry? And that was where we had some challenges. And it actually was part of the advantage of the concrete sealant is that it doesn't really dry itself healing on the concrete, right? So some of the, the challenges with the, the other competitors in that market is it dries into a hard, rigid covering to the concrete, which can crack or break. And then once that, once that happens, the water can get through. In this case, uh, it works the same way on the wood, but it's still a little tacky to the touch. It'll, it'll be feel greasy to your fingertips when you look at it. Uh, but we wondered if could we speed this process up a little bit? And there's uh, known ways to do this. Um, we, we looked at a couple of, of options. We looked at some blending and some reformulation of the concrete sealer to make it uh, dry up a little bit better. Uh, and again, I'm putting dry in quotes here uh, because it's, it's not really drying like that spilled glass of water. We're not evaporating anything here. It's actually a chemical process that makes a hard polymer shell is what makes it dry. Um, we, we use some um, compounds that are known broadly as Japan dryer. Uh, these polyurethane or Japaning or uh, uh, enameling of wood has been around for centuries. What we now know is the chemistry behind it. These are organometallic catalysts that you can add to speed up that process. 
Uh, we correct some blending with, with various uh, other oils. Boil linseed is a common one as well. Both of these actually improve the dry time uh, better. Uh, we went from um, almost three days down to um, half a day for drying when we added this uh, cicative or this uh, drying agent, this Japan dryer. So that's, that's much improved. That's much better. Um, we also decided, because we knew that Thompson's water seal was mostly paraffin wax, could we just use soy wax as a replacement? And so we tried some options in blending soy wax in with various solvents. We did find a solvent that worked well, uh, xylene. Uh, xylene, at least used to in the past, uh, was, was a fairly common solvent used in a lot of commercial, industrial, and, and home applications as well. Xylene's a, a component in uh, enamel paints, for example. Uh, this worked well, dried very fast, less than five minutes, extremely good water repellency, 85%. But the challenge, I, I think, we looked at this going forward, and certainly it's something that the maker of Thompson's Water Seal has struggled with, is uh, xylene is um, what's known as a volatile organic compound. There are regulations around the, the release, release of these, and it's not good to be breathing them either. So you need to use it outdoors and then stay away from it. You, you definitely want, don't want to use this indoors. Um, to, uh, to breathe these compounds in, and it's something the market's moving away from. So a few things we learned in this, in this process, we could, through some uh, reformulation, probably make a wood-based uh, wood sealant that utilize some of that, the technology ideas from the concrete sealant. Um, we could even go a whole new technology approach, or maybe an old technology repurposed with soy wax, uh, to uh, replace the paraffin uh, wax from petroleum and Thompson's water seal or a comp competing similar product. Uh, but part of that, we noticed there may be some specialized applications. Uh, maybe the wood deck in your backyard wasn't the best application, but maybe there's some applications that you need a, a food safe wood surface. You still want to protect that wood surface, but you don't want to uh, prepare food on something that's been treated with harsh chemicals. And so uh, we had some conversations uh, with Dr. Eva Havarova from uh, the for Forestry and Natural Resources Department. And she's one of the members of the Purdue uh, Wood Research Lab about some other applications. And I highlight that here because it's going to come back again later on. Just make a mental note. Well, I'll, it'll come back again. All right, so we, here, that was one short story about uh, some efforts of repurposing or expanding the use of an existing technology. What about some new technologies? And I want to focus in on some uh, options and opportunities in the polyol market. So polyols, as I mentioned before, can be used for making foams. Um, they also have applications in other spaces as well, some specialty lubricants. Uh, and, and one application I haven't talked about yet, but I will in the next slide. This is a commercial product. You can buy it today. Actually, Cargill is a fairly large supplier of polyols that go into these polyurethane markets. Uh, there are opportunities for other soybean processors like Bungay and, and ADM to get in, into this. Um, but there's another op option or application that we could use as well. And this is where I sort of focused uh, some of my research effort. And it's what's known as epoxidized soybean oil, a bit of a mouthful, ESBO, as a bio-based plastic. Uh, it's an important intermediate. It's actually a step towards making polyols, but in itself, it is actually a fairly well-regarded and highly used product. Uh, in 2017, it was about a 300 million US dollar global market. 220,000 tons of oil were consumed in this, so it does move the pile a little bit. And it has a couple of important applications. It's a plasticizer and a UV stabilizer. So maybe you need to explain what that is. A plasticizer, is something that turns a plastic material from hard and brittle to soft and rubbery. So this rubber duck here. Uh, it can also be used in other applications like the lining of these uh, cans. Um, so they don't rust over time. They put a, a lining in these cans or maybe you've never noticed, next time you open your jar of pickles, there's a little rubbery ring on the inside of the lid that helps it seal when you screw the lid back on. Uh, these are rubberized materials as well. Uh, epoxidized soybean oil is widely used in, in these because the main other alternative in the market, at least until about three or four years ago, was a, a petroleum-based product known as bisphenol A. 
Unfortunately, bisphenol A, uh, in the body, when you consume something with it, it disrupts estrogen activity, natural estrogen activity in the body. And so it's, there's good reason to eliminate it. Many countries have already phased it out. And ESBO has the same function, but it's food safe. So besides these food safe or these rubber ducks that maybe uh, your child or grandchild uses in the bathtub and will stick in their mouth, you want to have something safe in it. It's also used as a UV stabilizer. Um, the biggest market for that is, is mixing it in with PVC. So if you've ever driven down a country road in Indiana and you, you see all of those electric poles and there's always these uh, PVC gray pipes that are, that are bringing the, uh, the lines down to be buried, all of those contain some amount of ESBO to keep it from getting brittle as it bakes in the summer Indiana sun. So there's a fairly substantial market for this. Um, I'll have to talk a little chemistry here to get into some of the details of, of how this works. But on the top here, we see a, uh, an example of um, uh, a soybean oil molecule that contains uh, what are known as fatty acids uh, that contains some unsaturated double bonds. These uh, unsaturated double bonds are what makes it an oil and not hard like a fat. Uh, it, it's also what provides some health benefits. And it's also something that biotechnology has uh, allowed us to do some alteration and fine tuning of soybean as well. This molecule on the right is oleic acid. And many of you are probably familiar with high oleic soybean oil, uh, where we can replace um, a fairly small percentage of this oleic um, and swap out these linoleic and linolenic, these two and three unsaturated versions with versions of just this one single unsaturation. To make a oxidized soybean oil, we use some chemistry. We add oxygen. Uh, these O's are oxygens that are added to um, the backbones of these uh, lipid molecules. These oxygens are highly reactive, uh, and it's what makes the uh, ESBO valuable for uh, preventing uh, UV damage as plastics uh, bake in the sun. Um, they, they, they eat up or consume up the free radicals that are, that are produced when UV light shines on plastic. Uh, they also change the property of the oil, make it very, very viscous and elastic, the, the other application I talked about. And because they're reactive, we can do chemistry in the factory or in the laboratory to do other things with it, like make foams with it. And this is where we transition from this product into those polyols for foams. Now, uh, I mentioned that this is already a, a, a global product. There's a fairly large market for this already. It's a fairly dirty and dangerous process to convert soybean oil into this product. Uh, it requires the use of some, some fairly strong acid, sulfuric acid and acetic acid. We have to add to the process. Not only that's a cost of adding it, but it needs to be removed and that adds additional cost. Uh, we need to get oxygens from somewhere and for the chemistry to work, we can't use oxygen from the air. We use hydrogen peroxide. Now the hydrogen peroxide you have in your medicine cabinet at home is highly diluted in water and it's fairly safe. But if you have concentrated uh, hydrogen peroxide, um, it's very dangerous. Um, it's actually can be used as part of rocket fuel. Um, and in order to actually do the chemistry to make our high, our, our peroxide soybean oil, um, we uh, combine this with an acid like the acetic acid I mentioned to make something called a per acid. These are very reactive uh, acids. These are very reactive acids that are extraordinarily dangerous. And in fact, they're made on site and consumed as they're being made because they can't even be transported. They would, it's too dangerous to even transport them over the road. Um, and because of, of this danger and it's kind of a dirty process for cleanup, there's very little ESBO production in the US. It's moved to China, it's moved to other countries where maybe the environmental regulations are a little more lax than they would be in the US. But I think we can do better and there's some opportunities to do better. So we've been looking at uh, using uh, a bio-based alternative, replacing those harsh uh, acids with an enzyme that comes from a fungus known as Candida antarctica. Uh, there's just a, a photograph through a microscope of what these uh, little uh, fungi look like. They're yeast, they're a kind of yeast, they're different yeast that, than they're used to bake bread or brew beer. Uh, but they're very common uh, in the environment and they make a lipase, which naturally will break down uh, soybean oil and other oils, fats and, and lipids. 
but they also are able to synthesize these per acids that we need and can be used then to synthesize these oxidized soybean oils. So let me, you know, a little chemistry again, talk through this again, what's actually going on in this process is we have a, a small acid like acetic acid, we add sulfuric acid to drive the chemistry. We need our um, uh, hydrogen peroxide in order to add, uh, to be the source of the options we add to our soybean oil. Um, three things we need to add in, one that's necessary to actually make the product, it ends up in the product, the oxygen hydrogen peroxide, and two, that we've got to clean up and get rid of at the end of the process. Well, we can replace those with an enzyme, and here's how it works. Uh, we still need the hydrogen peroxide, we need a source of oxygen, but instead of adding an acid, we're going to use the lipase activity, the enzyme, to break down a small percentage of the soybean oil into what are known as free fatty acids. Reaction one. That same enzyme can take these free fatty acids that are generated, like this oleic acid we see here, and clip the oxygen from this hydrogen peroxide on the end and make a reactive molecule that will epoxidize our soybean oil. So already a cleaner process. We don't need to use um, additional chemicals that we have to add and then clean up. Uh, maybe this is a good approach. It has some other advantages as well. Uh, the other process is, is kind of dangerous in, in the sense that it's hard to control the temperature and it's hard to uh, manufacture at large scale in a continuous manner. They do it batch wise so that you can have controlled batch processing rather than a continuous manufacturer, which has a lot of economic advantages. Enzymes can be immobilized on the surface of small pellets that can be packed in a reactor and you can just flow the oil over it and react it while the catalyst remains static in place. We already know how to use this technology. Enzymes immobilized this way are used to make high fructose corn syrup all around the globe today. There are commercially available versions of these candida lipases on um, immobilized supports, so we can, we can buy them. They can be procured at industrial scale as well. Uh, we think we can get better yields and definitely lower equipment costs, and I'll show that here in a moment. Uh, but some things to consider that we'll, we're working through uh, right now is how to make sure that these enzymes last a long time. We want to use or reuse them because they're fairly expensive, much more expensive than sulfuric acid, which you can buy a rail car for fairly inexpensively in comparison. Uh, and make sure we don't have some issues of physical and chemical behavior in, in the reactor. So we began uh, looking at uh, the economics of this. So we perform what's known as a techno-economic analysis. We develop a uh, process and we model it in a computer and estimate the cost of what this would look like at scale using some information from small scale and see how this works out. This was a great collaboration. Actually, one of my last collaborations with Wally Piner before his passing. Uh, but he's been a, he was a great collaborator with me over the years at looking at these kind of questions on how we can better use agricultural materials. And we compared side by side two uh, facilities that would process uh, 18,500 uh, tons of soybean oils a year, uh, the existing current commercial technology and uh, a technology that we proposed might work that could use these enzymes. And we pulled from that an important factor that drove our research. We, we understood from this economic analysis that we need these enzymes to last at least 100 days of continuous operation to make it cost competitive with the additional process. And that gave us a target to work towards and it gave us a metric to know when we were successful. So first, uh, we wanted to optimize our process. There is some literature out there previous to us starting this pro project that we knew the lipases would work. It had been tested in sort of a, an experimental proof of concept way, but we wanted to make sure that it would work in an, in an industrially relevant way. So a lot of the papers that were published um, blended in solvents, like the xylene I talked about before uh, for making the wa Thompson's water seal replacement. Um, in, in the process they use in the lab, but you would never want to use that in an industrial process. You, it's, it's an added cost you have to add in, something you have to clean up at the end, and nobody should be eating xylene. You don't want to put that in your mouth, much less breathe it. 
So we were able to prove and show that you don't need to add the solvent. It works okay without the solvent added. We don't need to add any additional acids. Some of the literature we're adding these acetic acids or other acids. We can use the enzyme to make the acid from the soybean oil, use up just a little bit of it, and then process the remainder of the oil into our product. And we got outstanding yields. We got uh, greater than 90% yields uh, in a reasonably short amount of time. Um, and we sort of optimize the conditions for that process to move forward. So where are we today? So the next thing we need to look at is could we meet this mark of 100 day uh, continuous use of the enzyme? Uh, the short answer is, at least in the initial way we ran the experiments, no, we're, we're quite a ways off. Uh, about a, a useful lifetime of about two days instead of the target of, of 100 days. Now that sounds like a long ways off, and it is, but for a lot of bioprocessing, that's actually not an insurmountable goal. Uh, we're, we've already shown that we can lower the temperature a bit to improve the lifetime. Uh, what we see down here is actually a statistical analysis of, of analyzing how we can uh, operate the process in order to uh, e extend the lifetime of the enzyme. And we also know that uh, the, the presence of the hydrogen peroxide is, is a particularly problematic one. And we're actually look, now looking at can we uh, break the process up into some distinct phases so that we have um, a few enzymes that are used to actually be in contact with the hydrogen peroxide and they may be used up or die or, or quit working faster than the bulk enzyme that actually makes the product. And by doing that, you can get sort of a net average lifetime that uh, would meet the targets. And so this is ongoing work that we're doing as well. We're also very interested in how, how we might be able to use high oleic uh, soybean oil as part of this process. Uh, there are a, a, a lot of opportunities for using straight high oleic soybean oil or blends of traditional and high oleic in order to get customized properties. Uh, the, the customers for this are looking for a, a specific thickness or viscosity of, of these products, um, a specific number of uh, active sites where you can do chemistry in order to get the product that you want, that has the rigidity that you want, that has the foam properties that you want, how big do you want the bubbles, uh, how small do you want the bubbles, those kind of properties are all things you can dial in. And I think one of the opportunities that having high oleic soybean oil is it broadens the opportunities for potential applications. So I've used up a good portion of my hour talking some research. Let's talk some your outreach sort of things. Um, the, the Student uh, Soybean Innovation Competition, uh, as I mentioned, was, is uh, a, a very long commitment, an appreciated commitment, a partnership between Purdue and ISA, and that's, I think, really uh, bringing in a lot of students that wouldn't think about not only agriculture, but soybeans as an interesting product. So let me uh, talk a little bit about uh, this. So I began uh, supervising uh, the competition uh, in 2016. Uh, for the 2016-17 competition year. I've long been a technical mentor of students in the competition. For my entire time at Purdue, I have, I have mentored at least one student team every year uh, in the competition. One of the very first things I did that, that very first year was implemented uh, a summer internship uh, that uh, was open to students who successfully complete the competition known as Aspire. And I'll talk a little bit about that here in a few moments. Uh, another thing that uh, I implemented the year before I took took over, or a couple years before I took over, uh, there were some changes to the competition that, that made um, a number of milestones for the students to track their progress, but also help them achieve the goals of ISA and Purdue. And one addition we added to that in the, the, the second year I was uh, supervising the competition was a set of goals and specific metrics that we could work towards that would enhance the, the reach and the impact of the competition. And those I think have largely been successful. We'll talk about, I'll talk about those in a moment. I think another great addition that uh, has come about in the last couple of years is in, in 2018, we started a partnership with ADM to supply commercially available soy intermediates, soy protein isolate of various fractions, soy uh, protein, soy holes, the sort of thing that if any of these products had some potential to be commercialized, 
and you wanted to be fast and, and you wanted to call up ADM and say, I need three rail cars of X, Y, and Z, you can get it because it's made today. Um, it's not a, 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 a lab scale, first of a kind prototype of something. It's using real materials that you can get at scale. I think that really adds benefit. This year, uh, Beck Hybrid Seeds has, has partnered as well, and they're supplying whole soybeans as well for the students to, to utilize. And, and in addition to that, we've made um, partially due to COVID, but I think it's something we'll keep doing long in the future is we're developing a starter kit. So once the teams sign up, they get a box. It's got samples of all of the materials from ADM. It's got some soybeans. It's got some uh, bits and bobs of materials that they might need in order to get started fast and quickly in doing some experimentation. And then once they know what they know, they can come back and get larger quantities of the specific things that they need. All right, so I mentioned these goals and these metrics, and let me unpack these um, and, and how we've addressed them. So we want to, in, in a partnership with ISA, we talk through these, and these are the three that we've, we've come to and used the last few years. Recruiting students with a diverse set of skills and skill levels to compete in the competition. So Dean Plot mentioned uh, the REACH, uh, more than 20 different majors, uh, five to seven colleges across the breadth of uh, Purdue University. But I want to also point out on the skill levels. Uh, one thing when we went back and, and looked through the data in previous competitions, we noticed was that many times the students that took home the big prize, this was their second or third, sometimes even the fourth time that they were in the competition. And that pipeline that get a good experience, learn what is what it takes to win, and then come back again was important. So we want to be delivered in recruiting those, those first year students fresh on campus, get them engaged, get them engaged for their whole time at Purdue and um, get them better skills and, and, and frankly, better products at the end of the competition. And number two, to deliver diverse and high quality product prototypes and some preliminary marketing to ISA. And then finally, enhance public awareness of student innovation. I get the word out to the broader public on this. Uh, so let me kind of step through what, what for those of you that aren't familiar with the competition, what this kind of looks like. I'll just highlight really quickly here the, the, through the next couple minutes what some of the, the winning teams look like. So the 2016-17, uh, these products tend to, you know, as an introduction, uh, tend to focus on consumer products, the sort of thing that you would buy at Lowe's or Home Depot or Walmart or Target or Kroger, something that uh, I always tell the students, when you go home for Thanksgiving and explain to your grandma what you're doing, she knows what you're talking about. You know, don't talk about polyols and high epoxy, something that she doesn't know what that is, but she knows what a filter soy, she knows what a furnace filter is. Um, so that was the winning team that way, uh, that year. Uh, so soy uh, profession was, was a sort of an odor uh, application for uh, use in, and actually the, We'll talk about how, how they took that the next level and aspire here in a moment um, to, to make your restroom smell a little bit better. 2017-18, uh, here are our winners. Soytech um, uh, was the winning team. Uh, they were replacing another natural product, guar gum, uh, for use in something known as hydro seeding. So uh, you see the road crews along the highway or the interstate spraying something out of a truck on the side of the road. They're, they're planting seeds what they're doing is they need those seeds to stick on the soil so they can germinate not wash away and so they're using soy protein in order to enhance that 2018-19 uh, uh, stroy soy seal soy shield the, the winner was stroy uh, they were, uh, made straws uh, that weren't made out of plastic but never said made made from soy uh, but i'm going to highlight soy seal because they made a wood sealant that is safe for use in the kitchen or the restaurant uh, they're showing here their cutting board that they've uh, added a, a sealant to. Uh, so this goes back to now several minutes ago, I mentioned this wood sealant idea and uh, some ideas that we sort of planted as seeds uh, to, to some students see how they would take things forward. And they um, went a, a bit of a different direction uh, than where we started from, but I think in a good way. And then last year's competition, um, Herbisoy, Double D, and Soy Flex, and, you maybe recognize those two uh, photographs of those two individuals. 
that was a second place team from the year before came back again and, and took first place. Just highlighting that importance of uh, starting students early, getting them uh, engaged and getting them to skill, uh, develop their skills. Uh, Herbisoy was a soybean based uh, non glyphosate herbicide. So an interesting uh, potential marketing idea there. We talk about metrics and I, there's a lot of numbers here. I, I kind of want to hit some highlights, but I think it, personally, I found it useful in focusing our efforts where we can make real impact. So a few of the metrics that we track closely, student reach, initial teams, final teams, colleges, majors, and new stories. Here are some examples. Student reach, these are the numbers of students that in the first four weeks of the fall semester, they either had a, an in-person interaction with myself or especially Mickey Creech, who I can't say enough about our, our managing uh, director of the program, um, in a classroom, uh, out of the classroom, uh, engage with students in some way, form, or fashion. Um, the first year we tracked it, we found out we were getting in front of about 1,500 students. We pushed that number up to 4,700 students. A little bit more than 10% of all students at Purdue had some interaction with this competition this fall. Uh, we track initial teams. So I talk about uh, milestones that the, the teams have. We're about actually this year to cross that first uh, milestone. Actually register your team. Here are our team members. Uh, that closes uh, on Sunday, uh, November 1st. Uh, we're down a little bit, but uh, students, like many of us, procrastinate and wait till the last minute to uh, put their uh, names in. Um, we may be down a little bit as well. Uh, COVID is a bit of a struggle, but I will say of the teams we have, these are the passionate go-getting teams. Because um, I'll highlight the second row and the third row. You may notice, man, you start with 33 teams and you only end up with 11. What happened? It's really hard to come up with a new idea that's never been tried or done before and then actually make a prototype that works. And so a lot of teams fail along the way for a wide variety of reasons. And we work hard to make sure that they fail in a way that is at least some success for the team. So they feel good enough about it. They want to come back again and try again the second time. Um, some of the best conversations are, are the teams, even the ones that make it to the end and don't get the prize on the ride back on the bus from Indianapolis, they're already brainstorming about next year's ideas. Um, uh, one team, and I'll even highlight a team member here in a moment, uh, I remember they, they didn't place that first year, I advise them, and between, the, from the bus ride back from the banquet until they put their idea in uh, around November 1st that year, that idea they put in was number 168. And we met periodically over the summer, they pitched me ideas and I would say, well, that's already been done or maybe think of this. And so the students work hard with this. We have wide reach across many, many majors. These are not just students in the College of Agriculture, or not just engineering students, but science, marketing, business, pharmacy, health and human sciences. You think of it at Purdue and there's a student that's been involved. And there are ways that they all can contribute. And then we track news stories as well, where it gets picked up and, and broaden the word on this. And I mentioned Aspire before, and I want to kind of unpack some of this too, or what this program is trying to do. This is a fairly common uh, graphic you'd see in a lot of, of talk about innovation and, and entrepreneurship. Um, there's a lot of funding generally early on and getting the idea out there, the basic science, proof of concept, the initial prototyping. And then there's kind of a gap before the risk is low enough that a company is willing to invest. Um, the so-called valley of death often is, is referred to for this. And I think the competition does a good job of kind of getting us started in that. We get some good ideas, but we need something to kind of carry those ideas forward. And this was really what was behind Aspire. So Aspire is a partnership with the Foundry at Purdue. Uh, this is part of our technology development programs uh, broadly at Purdue. And if you've paid attention to some of the news uh, out of Purdue, um, Purdue is one of the top innovative universities in, in developing patentable ideas, startup companies in the nation. Uh, these are just some uh, examples of some companies that uh, I had some involvement with or have affiliation with the College of Agriculture that have benefited from interactions with uh, the Purdue Foundry. And so we wanted to get the students involved in doing some of the same thing that startup companies like uh, Vincent's out of uh, Purdue's uh, food science department do in order to be market ready with their technology and their ideas. 
So this is ASPIRE. ASPIRE stands for the Agasway Product Innovation Realization Entrepreneurship Program. It's a bit of a mouthful. ASPIRE is what we talk about it. And really, there's, the approach is two-pronged. Uh, we want to make sure the students build upon the very preliminary market analysis they do in order to put their product idea forward to the competition and, deep, and develop a deep understanding of the marketplace and do this in, an, in a guided and a, a real way. And so we were able to fund these summer internship uh, internships for students uh, through part of the Purdue Moves investment in the Plant Sciences Sciences Initiative here at Purdue. And so our first group was in 2017. So what do they do? Well, we make them talk to people. They need to talk to customers. They need to talk to potential in, uh, company collaborators. They need to understand what's really valued in the marketplace. Uh, this falls actually very closely to the, the successful national program um, known as i through the National Science Foundation. i does the same thing. If you have an academic who's got a great idea, the first thing that they make them do is talk to people. At least 100 contacts with potential consumers. And they, they don't just talk with people. They come in with a guided set of questions and how to interpret the data to translate what they hear into what the customer values that will drive a purchase decision and translate those into product specifications. What does the product need to have to be the minimally viable product that somebody's going to want to buy? And then they use that to refine their prototype, do some testing, develop a, a business plan. And if they're really interested in one move forward, they can even form a company and, and pitch for some initial seed investment. Um, I think more important than that is really developing the human capital for, for the next generation of entrepreneurs broadly. Um, and I'll talk uh, about a couple of alumni of the competition that, that did that without the benefit of Aspire. And I think we're going to really broaden the reach by having this uh, available going forward. So really quickly, I'll kind of step through these. A lot of the same faces we've seen before. We're recruiting out of student teams that made it to the final. Uh, of the competition, they put forward a, a product. Uh, we really encourage the, the teams that were in the, in the winning brackets because they tend to have good ideas to, to, to move them forward and, and look at some uh, potential uh, opportunities. Uh, our two on the right here is that soy profession one. Um, a couple things came out of their conversation. Um, they, th they were kind of mar marketing initially a, a novelty thing to use at home. But the O'Hare Airport Authority was really interested because nobody likes to go to the airport and have a smelly bathroom. And they would like to have something there that would be automated that help between cleanings to keep things uh, nice and fresh. They also looked at other applications of odor. Lagoons that uh, can find animal feeding facilities. And actually they moved forward on some options and opportunities in that space as well. So to give you an idea of the importance of getting out and talking to, to people. Um, the next year's class, uh, the Soy Tech, I mentioned that Soy Tackifier group, they actually did some trials in, in a county uh, here in Indiana to try, try this out at scale, which was, which was great, and did some more market analysis. Um, the next team here, the, the, the next year, um, the team on the right here was the, was the one that uh, made a, a soy base, a windshield wiper fluid uh, that could be used. Um, unfortunately, we had to cancel last summer's uh, internship uh, with, with COVID, but we're working for, uh, to move forward for next year with the, the next round of uh, Aspire uh, interns. So I'm going to wrap up here with some, some ideas about vision going forward uh, to 2025. Uh, I think there's still a lot of opportunities for expanding existing technologies and developing some uh, novel approaches for bioproducts, uh, particularly in that space of novel uses of polyols uh, for a wide variety of applications. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for more research collaborations through the uh, United Soybean uh, Board and others. And I'll, I'll highlight a couple of those in a moment. Uh, in the outreach uh, um, piece as well, I think there's a lot of opportunities for broadening some interaction with the, the broader startup community, entrepreneurship community in Indiana. Uh, many of these Aspire students actually get plugged in with that because they're part of that, that foundry system and get to know a lot of people. Uh, continue to develop some industry partnerships like I, we've developed with ADM for those raw materials. Um, and I think the missing opportunity, that which we've, we've 
taken one step towards is uh, reaching out to the competition alumni and re-engaging them in some important ways. So many of you may remember when Jocelyn Wong uh, came back and gave that um, uh, address at the banquet that we held here at Purdue University uh, two years ago. Uh, at the time, she was chief marketing officer at Lowe's, the, the home improvement store. She's now chief, chief customer officer at GoPuff, uh, a new startup company. Uh, she was uh, the, the leader of the team that made those Prang crayons that many of you are familiar with if you've had uh, much interaction with ISA. And I really like this quote here that, you know, through the competition, she became so motivated. You know, she discovered something about herself she didn't know, and, it's, and it kind of changed the trajectory of, of her life. We've had a lot of alumni that we, I think, should be re-engaging with. I'll just give you just one other example. Here's a more recent alumnus, Alvin Ang. Um, he led the team that uh, worked until they got that 168th idea. Uh, he graduated uh, that year. They won with this Denatrol, this uh, denture cream. Uh, at the time, we've, they found that the regular formulations included a zinc compound that actually caused um, people who use it, their gums to degrade over time. And so it's been removed from products, and they found a way to do this without having to um, uh, use zinc anymore in the products. Uh, Alvin left Purdue. Uh, as he said in his quote here, I was inspired to go beyond talking and start doing. He went on to found four companies. He's not been out that long. He's only been uh, a graduate for nine years. And he's currently a VP of operations at Turn River Capital. This is a Silicon Valley venture capital firm. And so he's really come a long ways. I think there's more opportunities to engage with alumni, re-engage with alumni, more collaboration. Uh, United Soybean uh, Board, we, Agronovus is a great uh, opportunity in the state. And, and I know there's some innovation ideas already going between ISA and uh, Agronovus. I think there's some opportunities there as well. Um, biosynthetics uh, has made a bit of a splash, you know, in Indianapolis, making a, a bio-based, soy-based uh, motor oil. And I think a big opportunity that's yet to be realized, and we do have some opportunities at Purdue, and I'm involved with some of these aviation biofuel uh, projects. Uh, this is just a, a shot of United and, and their efforts at using vegetable oil-based replacements for aviation fuels. Uh, you think biodiesel is a big market. Um, you know, maybe there's some electrification happening in ground transportation, but there's not going to be transatlantic battery-powered jumbo jets anytime soon. And so we're going to need fuels, chemical fuels to do that, and bio-based and soybean-based, I think, have some real opportunities here for this. So thank you so much. I see there's some uh, questions coming in the chat, and I'm happy to answer uh, many of these as well. Yep. Thanks, Nate. And that is really interesting and exciting um, what you and the teams have been doing. There are a couple of questions in the chat about the slides. And yes, we will be sending uh, a recording and a survey to the registrants after the live event ends. So folks will have access to this information as well. And Nate, before we get into a couple of the, the typed question, I had one for you. Can you tell sure. the folks a little bit more about the student competition and how it's judged and by whom? Oh, um, it was, yeah. No, absolutely. So the, the competition is, is judged by a panel of uh, judges that the Indiana Soybean Alliance assembles. It includes some former board members and it includes industry representation. So we have uh, a perspective and, and we've had great uh, individuals that have given back again and again from industry to participate in this. Um, not only do they work in industry, they tend to work in the new product development and innovation aspects of those businesses and really have a feel for what it takes to take a product to market, uh, conceive of an idea and bring it forward. And they bring some really good perspectives uh, to the rest of the, the judging team as they, they think about how to, how to move a product, product forward. Um, I really enjoy interacting with the uh, former board members as well. Um, they uh, get to interact with the students, but also they bring that perspective of if I were standing in uh, Home Depot make, trying to make a purchasing decision or in Walmart, you know, what would I be looking for? Um, and that's a, a very valuable perspective as well to bring. And, and the, the conversations are always uh, productive and 
Um, I often come in, I have to keep my mouth quiet because I, I often come in a little bit biased with which, which teams I think are going to come out on top. I'm not always correct, but I'm usually, probably not the order, but I usually have a good sense for who's probably going to end up at the top. Um, but I, I, and I hope the, the board members who participated over the years uh, ask them um, if you have a chance to interact with them, uh, what they've gotten from it. But almost to a, a one that I've asked that question, they've found it very beneficial. They've enjoyed working with the other board members, with the uh, company representatives, and especially the students. Um, these are very passionate students that are doing this on top of their very difficult coursework. Uh, this is, they're not getting any course credit for this. They're doing this because they want to do this. Yeah, great. Thank you. And my takeaway last year when I was sitting in it for the first time, I was shocked that the students aren't getting any credit for this, that it's all volunteer effort that they're putting forward and they pour their passion and their heart into it. So yeah, thank you for, for that. Couple questions on the chat. Um, one about the word wood sealant product or or the wood penetrator. Don't know what we're really calling that. Um, looks like that may have a promising future. Has there been any work or is there thinking around pressure treated lumber um, and how this could possibly work with that that sort of technology? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, and it's one we haven't looked at, um, especially with the um, the copper-based uh, uh, pressure treating treatments that are done. Um, so I think you know a little bit about how sicatives work, because uh, it's it's often those the transition metal zinc and copper organometallic compounds that we use to dry. So it, it may actually uh, be an inter interesting thing to look at. We haven't examined those directly as a as a potential application. Um, and there may be some, uh, there may be some opportunities. Um, we we kind of went some, some other directions on, on moving that forward, but I think it's worth revisiting some, some applications uh, that are not food based or, or food applications of wood based like utensils and cutting boards. Mm -hmm. And Nate, I think what's also interesting about that, and you brought it up when you were talking about the, the research you're doing around wood, is that Indiana has such a diverse definition for agriculture, including our lumber industry, right? That marrying some of those disciplines together um, is really a real synergy that we within Indiana provide that maybe some other, other areas just don't have that. No, I, I agree. And I, it was a wonderful resource, I think, to have the, the Wood Research Lab here on Purdue's campus. And they work uh, at uh, using Hoosier wood-based products in a wide variety of ways. And so how better to marry that than with uh, soybean oil also grown here in Indiana with uh, wood products. Absolutely. Another question from Steve Carter about the Aspire activity. Can you talk a little bit more about how that interacts with the foundry and then how do students kind of graduate or evolve out of Aspire into potentially other entrepreneurial opportunities? Sure. So. Uh, they, they work directly with the foundry. Uh, they, um, they actually go through the same curriculum, I will call it, uh, that uh, faculty entrepreneurs will go through. Uh, it's a program that the, the, the foundry is brown, brand, branded, excuse me, branded as Firestarter. Uh, so there's sort of this boiler maker uh, imagery, right? A foundry, a boiler maker works at a foundry and they use fire to, to heat and bend steel, so Firestarter. Um, the, so they go through the same program that uh, any of these other startup companies you've mentioned or that I mentioned uh, go through. Uh, they're encouraged to participate as fully with the, the events that the Foundry holds. Uh, they hold uh, weekly coffee discussions with entrepreneurs that come in to, uh, to Purdue, the entrepreneur community more broadly in the greater Lafayette and the multi-county area. Um, some of those students go on to just get the bug and 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 really go forward with it. it these programs didn't exist when Alvin, the, the alumnus that I, I mentioned, uh, was uh, here, but he was involved with the foundry at that time. And I think it was part of, even though he, he earned a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering here at Purdue University, um, he left here and turned around and his first efforts were to found a bunch of companies and, and now works in, in technology startup in, in Silicon Valley. Um, and certainly of, of the, the more recent Aspire alumni I've talked to, they 
definitely been very interested and in, in passionate in, in that space. Uh, the soy, the filter, the furnace filter group, um, there were sort of two very passionate individuals that uh, took that forward. And one uh, went through the Aspire program and it was because uh, he wasn't graduating until December. He and his partner were seniors, but he had a few classes to make in December. His other one, his other partner graduated and already had a job in Indianapolis in entrepreneurship and startup uh, there. So working with some of the organizations in the Indianapolis entrepreneurship community. So uh, it's a great avenue for uh, students to get involved. I, one thing I didn't mention is every single team has two faculty advisors, mm -hmm. one with a technical focus on maybe the chemistry or the biochemistry or the, the technical aspects and a business focus uh, a faculty member from the Cranard School of Business or from uh, the entrepreneurship program uh, here at Purdue University. And so the, the students um, may have come from that background and joined a, a team with the technical know-how or the or vice versa is, is possible and happens all the time. Excellent, thank you. Well, are there any other questions from anyone? You can um, type them into the Q&A function or you can unmute yourself um, and ask them. I just want to say thank you so much to Nate and Courtney for allowing us this unique venue to do this. And Nate, that was a fantastic talk. I think there was something for everyone in it. I learned a lot, even though I know what you do. I really, really enjoyed it. I do have to go to another meeting, so I am going to sign up, sign off. But thank you both uh, for all you've done to continue to enhance this collaboration. Bye. Thank you, Dean Plout. All right, if there's no other questions from anyone, Dr. Mosier, again, thank you uh, for all of this. Thank you for everything you're doing to support the current and future scientists and entrepreneurs that are coming out and everything you're doing to continue to grow demand for Indiana soybeans and the support for Indiana farmers. As we mentioned, uh, the folks who are on this will be getting a survey with a link to the recording. And if anyone has any further questions or any further follow up, please feel free to email or call us or text us and we'll be happy uh, to pass those on. So again, everyone, thank you. Have a great afternoon and stay safe out there. Bye-bye.